I thought I'd start a new series on how we used to get things done back in the day, and this was inspired by a recent upload by LGR where he talked about his newly acquired Acer Aspire PC. I had a digital Starion 917 around the same time that the Acer Aspire was launched and was on par spec-wise with LGR's machine, although he had slightly more memory and more video RAM. But aside from that, they were pretty well matched. In LGR's video, he mentioned that he wasn't able to get the exact system restore CD for his model machine, but someone had uploaded an image of a similar model to archive.org. Now, I never expected to have a Starry on PC ever again, and I mentioned in a previous video that I'd had a saved search on eBay for a number of years that would ping me any time somebody listed anything to do with a digital Starion. Well, a few years back, I did receive a ping telling me that somebody had listed not only the installation CD, but the floppy disk, the manuals, and a mouse mat. So I knew I had to have them. And when the CD arrived, I put it into my computer and had to poke around. And I had had the thought of creating a VM and restoring the CD to that VM. But unfortunately, there was a software lock that I hadn't considered. The software on the CD does a check for a particular string in the BIOS. And if that string isn't found, the extraction of the contents of the CD would not occur. Now, when I was poking around the CD, I did notice that basically it contained a massive 500 megabyte zip file. Now, I know that passwords can be cracked on zip files, and I found a website that I could upload the zip file to, and I let it do its thing. And it took a good number of hours, but unfortunately it failed. At this point, I was slightly disheartened. So I put the CD, the floppy, and the manual back into storage and kind of forgot about it. Until one day when I was browsing vintage software on archive.org, I thought, let me just try searching for Digital Starion to see if anything came up. So somebody had uploaded an image of the CD and floppy, but with the password for the zip file. So at this point I was super excited. So I went back to creating a VM, and this time instead of using the utility on the floppy disk to restore the zip file to the hard drive, I manually did it. The software started to extract to the VM's hard drive, and when it rebooted, Windows started up. I was so close, but it failed. Now the install specified certain hardware that was in the physical machine, which unfortunately the VM didn't have. Now I had as closely as I could configured the VM to be a match to the hardware in the physical machine. There was something that was causing Windows to hang. I tried as much as I could, but I still couldn't get Windows to boot. However, I did now have an extracted copy of all the software and all the images and things that came with the actual machine. So I built another VM and attached this hard disk image to it and I could have a poke around. It wasn't quite the same as having the exact software, but I was happy to be able to at least see what was originally included on the machine. Anyway, I gave up again and put the CD floppy and manual back into storage. So after that preamble, let's get to the actual topic I wanted to talk about. And that is, how did we used to restore our systems back in the day? And I thought I'd show you using the actual Starion on what the process was. And once that's complete, we'll have a quick poke around the software to see what was installed. So why do I want to do this? Well, I'm really happy to have the original system restore CD and floppy disk. But these days, we're so used to things like Apple's internet recovery or the Microsoft Windows Media Creation tool. We often forget or have no experience on how things used to be done. And back in the day, we simply didn't have the bandwidth. So let's get started. Right after this message from our kind friends over at PCB Way. Our good friends over at PCB Way have kindly sponsored this video. PCB Way offers a variety of services from PCB production and assembly to 3D printing in various materials, injection molded plastics, and even sheet metal fabrication. They offer a very professional and high quality service for extremely reasonable prices. Check out a link for their website in the description below. So here's what I bought once again. I have to thank my friend and fellow enabler Blake Spot, as this was on the eBay US store and the seller didn't bother answering my questions regarding shipping to the UK. Actually the whole of this video wouldn't be possible at all without his help, so I'm eternally grateful. I'm pretty sure I can hear his eyes roll when I send him a message, but I'm thankful to have him as a friend. Anyway, here's a mouse pad and a stack of paperwork. We have quite a detailed manual with all the info that you'd need to know, and I remember this from all those years ago. I still really like the design that DEC went with around this time. There's plenty of information on how to look after the system, some diagrams as to where you would find which components on the logic board, as well as some handy tips and information should you wish to upgrade the system. 
some nice branded digital papers, a business reply slip, again digital branded, and this fantastically illustrated quick start guide. I'm sure most people would have thrown these away, so I'm super pleased that the person I bought all this from have kept it after all these years. For a lot of people computers were still a new thing, so having a nice vision like this on what plugs into where I'm sure was a godsend. Second to last we have the system restore CD and the boot floppy. The BIOS in this machine does not support booting from CD-ROM, so a boot floppy is essential, and we'll see it in action shortly. For those of you with a keen eye may have noticed the incredibly small warning that this CD won't work in another system. I missed this entirely when I bought it, and feel that learning to read may indeed be a useful life skill. Unusually we have a genuine Windows 95 CD with manual and product ID label. The product ID is actually required to reinstall the OS, so it needs to be kept safe. Before we start the process I have to preface this by saying that this isn't how every computer system from every manufacturer perform this operation. It will of course vary wildly from manufacturer to manufacturer. This is just how DEC goes about it, and this is what I have experience with. It does take a while to boot, but when hasn't booting from a floppy ever been slow? It loads a couple of things I don't understand, and a CD-ROM driver, and then you're taken to a menu. We'll choose option 1 here. I've never used option 2, but oddly number 3 doesn't work at all. I tried it earlier. I've heavily edited this install process as it's long. The first thing the installer script does is to format the hard drive. It's only 1.2GB but takes about 7 minutes from start to finish. You're given no less than 3 chances to change your mind before the drive is slowly erased, so you can't say you haven't been warned. Once the formatting is complete the script then begins to extract the contents of the aforementioned zip file using pkunzip, and fun fact viewers, the zip file format was created by Phil Katz, an American software engineer in 1989. He developed it whilst working on his program PKZip, which was designed for data compression and archiving. Katz's zip format quickly became popular due to its efficiency and the ability to compress multiple files into a single archive, making file storage and transfers much more convenient. The zip format has since become one of the most widely used file compression formats in the world, and is still very much in use today. The meaning of the word zip means to move at high speed, and the PK in PKZip are Phil Katz initials. Once the extraction is completed the script then calls a utility CRC tree to run and do a CRC check, which in this case is used to identify the files copied over by the previous step and make sure they are not corrupted. Thankfully there aren't too many files to check but it does take a few minutes to complete. There are what feel like so many reboots that take place during the restore process. The out of box experience makes you go through some different steps to a regular Windows 95 install, as many of those have already been taken care of for you, but you still need to choose a couple of things like your region, your keyboard layout, put in your user information, which incidentally has nothing to do with user accounts but is used to personalise who Windows is registered to. We then have to read all 17 million pages of the EULA before agreeing to whatever terms and conditions are in it. We enter the product key from the certificate of authenticity on the front of the Windows 95 manual which I mentioned we'd need earlier, before restarting again for the installer to scan what hardware is in the machine. When I started my IT career back in 1999 for a construction company, it involved installing and reinstalling Windows a lot. I still to this day remember the product key that we used to use, the dodgy serial number for WinZip and the barcode for a Cadbury cream egg. Seriously, if you work in retail this is a real lifesaver, it's 5020-1600. Start menu items are installed, the help is compiled and you're asked to choose a printer, which always annoyed me as our printer wasn't listed. Its older brother the BJC600 was, but not the newer 610 which we had. This meant a separate install afterwards, but using Canon's driver which was much more superior than Microsoft's offering, so it wasn't all bad. We're asked to choose our time zone, after which we have another restart. This time, when Windows is rebooted, it does look like a very generic Windows install, until the DEC Windows 95 application setup launches. This is where all of the customizations to Windows occur. It sets up a new start screen and some ghastly wallpaper along with some information in system properties. I also have vague memories that our Packard Bell multimedia executive also had a customised startup screen.
I'd be interested to hear if your computer had one too. Tell me in the comments below. Anyway, it sets a couple of applications to launch on startup before cleaning up after itself and performing a final reboot. So after about an hour and 15 minutes, we're ready to use the computer, aren't we? Well, sort of. The first thing that happens when the machine boots is the registration wizard and the welcome to Windows application launches. Both of which happily you never have to see again if you don't want to, but I want those eight free screensavers. So we're going to need to fill out the registration form and oh my God, it asks you for a lot of information. Dex short word nosy who their customers were and what their machine was going to be used for. The registration could be returned using the built-in modem if you wanted to be all fancy, or you were given the option to print it out and return it in the mail or by fax. DEC included a shell replacement of sorts. It wasn't anywhere near as complex as Packard Bell's Navigator or Microsoft Bob, but it was a simple interface with buttons on to help those less familiar with Windows 95 launch the bundled applications. These applications are neatly arranged into categories that are listed down the left hand side of the display. But here's a major shortcoming, it's entirely not customizable. So even if you did like to use it and perhaps preferred it in one way or another, there's no way to add apps to it moving forwards. I'm not familiar with Packard Bell Navigator or Microsoft Bob, so they might also be just as uncustomizable as Dex offering. I do rather like the aesthetic though. So let's take a brief tour of the bundled software. Here we see Microsoft Works, a productivity software suite developed by Microsoft and sold between 1987 and 2009. Works is smaller, less expensive and has fewer features than Office suites such as Microsoft Office, but was commonly included in such packs. Internet tools are installed under productivity and here we find apps from the usual suspects, AOL and CompuServe, as well as the Prodigy and Imagination Network. If we click on the Multimedia tab, we can see links to the discontinued digital multimedia titles such as Encarta 95, Bookshelf 95 or the Explorapedia World of Nature. All of these titles require a CD-ROM to run and will return an error if the CD is not in the drive. Then there's the Entertainment Pack. This isn't the normal Entertainment Pack though, it's a custom one with only 8 games. I always liked Rodent's Revenge. You have to trap cats by pushing blocks around whilst avoiding obstacles. It's not fast paced or anything, so it's ideal for a casual gamer. Next is Ski Free, which I adored, except for when the Yeti chased after you and ate you, although the animations of him jumping for joy were always a laugh. The graphics are crude and the gameplay is simple. Move the mouse to the left, the skier goes left. Move it to the right, he goes right. Just look out for trees, rocks and dogs. You're supposed to gain points by clicking the mouse and make the skier jump and do fancy moves. I loved it. You can still download a 64-bit Windows version though. Go on, Google it. The other games I could take or leave. Rattler Race is a more complex game than Nokia's Snake, which you play against a computer-controlled opponent and grow each time you eat some fruit. But if you get hit in your head with a flying ball, you die. It was infuriating. Fuji Golf, yawn, and the rest, meh. The educational tab has four links which users may have found useful, and under services you'll find lots of helpful information from DEC. There's a nice FAQ, and what to do before you call. Here you'll find more information about the warranty, and one of the more cooler options was to be able to access a BBS, or bulletin board service, to download latest software drivers and BIOS updates. Unfortunately though, this service was US only, and I never got the opportunity to try it. And finally, under Preferences, you can tell the computer to start Windows or launch the Getting Started Guide first. The bundled software pack isn't as extensive as what you'd find from other companies, but it was still a decent selection if a bit limited. No, I didn't mess up the audio capture on this video. For some reason, the included copies have all been encoded terribly. The AVIs on the Windows 95 CD, however, all sound fine. Before we look at our free screensavers, let's take a look at the hard drive properties and see how much space has been used. 464 megabytes, leaving us around 750 megabytes free. 
Of course, you could free up some more space by installing some of these apps. I mean, who needs software from ISPs? Who needs them at all? We didn't even have the internet yet. If we look at the system properties, we can see some nice branding. But the moment I know you've all been waiting for, what about our free screensavers? Well, I'll leave it up to you to decide if they're worth it or not. And for maximum effect, I won't talk over them and will let you enjoy them as they are. Feel free to fast forward if mid-90s ASMR screensavers are not your thing. Well, that about wraps things up. It's always fun to look back at these system restore CDs as they somehow feel like a time capsule or help transport us back to another time. I'm thankful to have mine, but I might put my two gigabyte drive back in and go back to my Windows 98 install. Thanks ever so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.